Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 126, Sean's Birthday AMA. Sean, that's me, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the pen and paper porter, the RPG maitre d'. I heard the other one earlier today, I thought it was amusing. Answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record these shows every, live every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. It would be awesome if you could join us. All right, with Sean's birthday hitting, happy birthday, by the way, and two concurrent and conflicting game sales going on right now on Amazon, we decided to try to take things easy on ourselves tonight. Instead of answering one of your questions we've got saved up and doing a bunch of research and deep diving and providing you all the info, instead, we're going to open the floor to our lobbyists, the awesome people who joined us live tonight on Twitch for the show, and answer their questions live. In addition to this AMA, I've got a review of the abstract strategy game, Reef, from Plan B Games. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We received quite a bit of feedback this past week, which is great to see. Up first, a couple of questions, uh, uh, comments on our cooperative kids game topic from a few weeks back. Up first, RG Gator writes... Good list. For anyone who plays cooperative games with kids, Zombie Kids Evolution and its sequel, Zombie Teens Evolution, are must-gets. <laughs> They're both a fantastic time. Brian McDonald writes, Some great ones made that list. Thanks, Mo. And finally, Doug Sartoir commented, Great list. Forbidden Island was a favorite for my little ones. If you like this sort of thing, take a look through the catalog of Ontario-based family pastimes who have focused exclusively on cooperative games since the early 70s. We just played a couple of games of Galaxy last night, and that's at familypastimes.ca. Well, thanks for the comments, everyone, and the game suggestions, Gator. Uh, these are games I personally tried, but we'll be sure to toss them in the show notes, as always. And I'm going to have to dig into Family Pastimes a bit more. I did take a quick look at the site. At first glance, it looks like they specialize in educational games for younger kids. Uh, the problem with that is they're probably games my girls are past at this point. But you know what? For parents of younger kids, you may be very interested in this. As usual, again, I will drop a link in the show notes. Next up, a comment from last week's main topic of superhero RPGs. Nathan V. writes, some thoughts on this. First off, Mo mentioned G+. <laughs> I knew I recognized you from somewhere. I had you in a few of my circles. Man, how I miss that platform. <laughs> Don't we all? Uh, I agree with Mo about D20 and <laughs> how everything feels forced into that framework. That's kind of what I like about it, though. For me, D20 games are less about the playability at the table. They <laughs> all end up feeling like D&D and more about creativity and design, trying to fit a round peg into a square hole. One Supers game that I really like that nobody seems to ever talk about is Mighty Six. It does take the uh, M&M Champions point-based crunch approach to Supers. The base to Mighty Six is Mini Six, a rules light version of the D6 system from the old Star Wars system. I would love to see more people talking about this game because I think it's quite fun. Well, thanks for the comment, Nathan. Um, I also badly miss G+. Uh, nothing's actually come even close to replacing that, uh, despite a number of sites trying their best to do so. Um, where Nathan left this comment is one of those knockoffs of uh, G+, plus, uh, plus Pora. Now, while I do appreciate the DIY, do-it-yourself nature of the D20 system, I get it. Like, we just talked about this last week during my White Star review and how awesome that OSR movement is for do-it-yourself, right? Make the game your own. And I do appreciate that kind of thing for having that in the D20 system. But to me, homebrewing your game is for homebrewing, right? It's for sharing with your group. It's if you want to sit there and, and take the... Um, the mental activity of trying to make a game work in D20, all the power to you. What bothers me is the amount of licensed games and rule books that are coerced into using that system. And that's what bothers me, right? It's the fact that people are publishing these games as brand new games, but they're just another version of the D20 system and they never quite work 
quite right. Plus, to be honest, it kind of feels like I'm buying the same game over and over. Like, I almost wish I could get a version of, say, Babylon 5 or get a version of Dark Judge Dread that just tells me what's different in their version. I already have the player's handbook or I have one of the other games that have all this information on it. So I kind of feel like I'm buying the same thing over and over. So fully a fan of playing with D20 and making it your own, but I don't know, like that should be your own, your own group, something you keep to yourself. Now enough about my feelings on D20. Have you had a chance to check out Mighty Six? Because I shared this with Sean earlier in the week when we got the comment. Well, it is on the way, but I went with a okay. physical copy and I didn't pay for the digital as well. So uh, that's that's going to be coming coming to me whenever drive through does the whole printing shipping hmm. thing. Uh, interestingly, I actually had a chat with my masks group about D20 systems this week, okay. totally separate from this, uh, and there was a pretty strong split, um, and not surprisingly based on people's experiences. The heavy D&D based and Pathfinder based players mm -hmm. just don't have as much experience in other games and call and fall back to it as a comfort food. Right. It's simply what they know. Totally uh, fair. Now, next up, we've got a comment on our Funfair review on YouTube. Coasters and Cosplays writes, As a playtester for this game, I can say there was a lot of playtesting that went into this game. Using a very polished mod on Tabletop Simulator for this game, it's available for free. And I agree with your concluding comments. I own and love Unfair and a bunch of heavier, modular, intense games. Yet this still will get played quite often because you can crank out a two-player game in about 40 minutes mm -hmm. and it's just simply fun as the title says also interesting to hear about the park designer in the games you've played well thanks for the comment coasters and cosplays uh you can definitely tell that funfair was well tested like it, that is one thing about that game. it just feels polished and i love that big game feel that you get in such a a, a short game now, I also feel I should note at this point that we have played multiple games since that review went live, and the park designer problem hasn't come up yet, again. Now, the thing is, though, it hasn't come out during the first turn, and that's where I found it to be a problem, was when it came up on the first turn. So I think the odds of that happening are low enough that it's enough of a fluke that maybe it's not quite as bad as I was thinking during the review. Though at this point, I'm still going to stand by my suggestion that if you do get it in the first turn, shuffle it back in. But I'm pleased to say that like that probably isn't going to come up often based on the size of that deck. Well, finally, a comment on one of our much older YouTube videos, a Tabletop Express episode called <laughs> Wedding Bells. Charlotte Lafage writes, how does this only have three likes? Thanks, man. This is so useful. I find it fascinating that episode is suddenly getting views. Like, I'm guessing it's just it's spring, right? It's wedding season, so all of a sudden people are discovering this. But, like, every single one of our ep Express episodes pretty much fell flat. Like, that's the reason we stopped doing them. They just weren't worth taking the time to do a second recording every week just to get, like, 10, 9, 5 views. Well, I'm glad someone at least found this one and found it useful. Plus, I assume congratulations are in order, Charlotte. Well, that's all for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One exciting thing we want to cover before we get into the main topic. And on Tuesday, March 30th, the day this episode goes live and out to the public, we are going to launch a giveaway for a digital copy of one of our favorite games of all time, Terraforming Mars. This contest will be open worldwide and we will pick one winner who we will provide by email a Steam code for the digital version of Terraforming Mars. And similar to our previous giveaways, this will run for three weeks. You'll enter via a widget on the blog that will go live on the 30th. Entrants will get entries for the usual things, right? Check out our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, retweet this, comment on the blog. We don't have the exact details yet, but all the stuff you see in every one of these board game giveaways. So be sure to watch tabletopbellhop.com for this Terraforming Mars giveaway to go live on Tuesday, March 30th. Also, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and join us for our live show because we do have a habit of giving out bonus entries on both. Plus, Patreon patrons at the $5 or higher level also will get bonus entries automatically. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. 
All right, at the top of the show, there are a few things going on right now that means we didn't have that much time on our hand last week and not enough time to really prep for this week's episode. One of the things going on, of course, is Sean's birthday. So happy birthday again, Sean. I mentioned it earlier, but Farrell will squeeze it in here as well. Well, thanks, Mo, and to uh, the lobbyists and, and folks on Twitter who have been uh, passing on gra- congratulations as well. I'm not much for parties, but the kids and I did have a great sushi dinner, and that's really all I need. Yeah, I got to admit, that, that that looked like good takeout sushi. That looked like really good takeout sushi. So what we decided to do tonight to make things easy for us is to host an AMA or ask us anything, uh, ask uh, questions, Q&A, a live Q&A here on Twitch. Uh, where people in our chat room, the lobby, can ask us questions live. Now, along with this, just in case the lobby isn't very forthcoming, uh, to be honest, we really didn't give anyone a heads up we were going to do this. Normally, if we have an AMA coming, we like to announce it for a couple weeks leading up to it. So totally fair if the lobby's unprepared for this. Um, I do have some shorter, easier to answer questions that we receive that aren't enough for a big full podcast episode, right? Sometimes people send in these questions at questions at tabletopbellhop.com that are just too quick to answer. Like, I can't drag them out long enough to make a full episode so i got a couple of those saved up that uh, we may get to if we don't get enough interaction from the lobby all right well to give the lobbyists a bit of time to think how about we start with one of those okay so uncle rico at bear underscore down 23 asks tabletop bellhop do you have any favorite roll and write games all right i i have had this one on the list for a while and you know what I want it to be a full blog post. I want this to be a full topic. It should be a full topic. What are the best roll and write games? It's a fantastic, it's something I've Googled. It's something people would look for. There is one huge problem. I would just be stealing other people's work. I have not played enough roll and writes. And like, like I don't, there's tons of them. People, they, they blew up. Wolfgang Warsh is the biggest designer who put out Ganshan Clever, or Just So Clever, was such a huge hit. Stronghold Games liked it so much that they bought his entire game license and put out something like eight games by Wolfgang Warsh. There's, I, I don't even know all the names. There's just tons of them. And then there's the, the other random write games, which I think get lumped into this, right? The flip and writes and the, 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 the you got roll and write, flip and write, but whatever other method of making people write things down and like i have played so few of these it's just not something i dove into i will admit part of this is the fact that stronghold games didn't want to work with us um never has in the past and and weren't interested they 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 only give out their games to what they call ambassadors and they only do that in the states so that is a part of it so shame on stronghold we're not working with awesome people like us but i just haven't played enough of them now, that said, I do have some favorites of the ones I played. So we'll answer this. But like I said, I, I couldn't do, like, we couldn't do a top 10. I don't even think I could do a top five. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to think about it. I got three off the top of my head, and maybe there's more. So the number one roll and write I have ever played, and I got to admit, I still dig this game a lot, is an older Euro game, of all things, published by Aaliyah. It's part of the Aaliyah Small Box games, and it's called St. Malo. And it is a pirate themed roll and write that uses dry erase markers on a board and you're rolling dice and you are building a fort. So think days of pirates and you're, the pirates are raiding, you're building cannons and you're also um, turning your city into different districts and working on the walls on the outside. And you're going to compare your number of pi- uh, cannons to the pirates. And it's a very thinky, rather heavy game. And that's what I liked about it. Because one of the things, I, I wouldn't say all roll and rights are famous for, but especially back when this game came out, most roll and rights, there was Uno, or not Uno, Yahtzee. And there were games based on it, right? They were pretty simple. When St. Malo came out, it was like, wow, this showed me that roll and rights can actually be quite heavy and quite good. And I really liked it. Like, that's, that's another, we probably have to add to the Sean Try It list. Because, <laughs> like, and the other thing, I don't see anyone talking about this. So I don't know if maybe it's longer to print. Some of those older Aaliyah games are. Uh, it was published by Rio Grande, I think. I'm not positive on that. Maybe hard to get nowadays. So that's my number one is St. Mallow. My number two is Through the Ages, but it's the, the roll and write version called Roll Through the Ages and specifically uh, the original game was called the bronze age but there was an expansion called the late bronze age so it's roll through the ages with the late bronze age expansion which is literally a print and play it's just a different score sheet you use while playing and this is a big chunky wooden game that reminds me of cribbage in a way because you roll the dice and then you use pegs in a wooden board to mark what resources you got and then you're going to use those resources to improve your city and build monuments and then at the end of the game once all the rolls are done you're going to get a total score 
And this gave you the feel of Through the Ages or a civilization style game, but in a roller rink. And the production's top notch. Like it had these thick wooden dice. It was really well made, really impressive looking game and played really well. Now I know they did put out a later game. I never tried the new one. Like it was a standalone game instead of just, um, it, was, it wasn't just an expansion. It was a follow-up. It might be the, the Steel Age or something. I'm not even sure anymore. The last one for me is I think Railroad Inc., Again, I haven't played many of these. Um, my friend Scott is the one that introduced me to it. And what I loved in that is you didn't roll your own dice. You rolled all the dice into the center of the table. Then everyone had to do something with those dice. That was the first time I'd seen that mechanic. And I ends up, I love that mechanic. I like it in Tiny Towns. I like it in Number 9. Um, I liked it. There was a garden game of flowers. Might be even called Flower Garden that used it. I love that everyone's working from the same pool. And what fascinated me is that by the end of the game, how everyone's thing is different. I love that it was just, we all started from the same base and we're all using the same dice. But if I show you my city and Sean shows you a city, they'll look completely different. And I love that aspect of it. Now, I'll admit, I never bought Roll Through the Ages because I had a feeling it would get tired quickly. Like, it was fun the first few games I played. Uh, I think I played it probably five times. But it just seems like it would get repetitive after a while. I didn't test that because, again, I didn't buy it. What looked like it would make it more interesting is the various different colors, right? So there was the blue set and there was the red set. And they gave you a couple special dice to keep things interesting. And I do have to admit, I didn't get to try those. It wasn't my copy of the game we played. And again, as something I mentioned at the start of the show and um, the audio that our patrons will get, I often am playing games with a new player. And so we never get to the expansion. Con, and that's what happens. I taught us the game. And it was great. And I tried it. And we played a number of games in a row. And then the next time I saw Scott, we played it again, but there was a new player. And then the next time Scott broke it out again, there was a new player. So it was just stuck to the basic rules. And he had both sets. So that railroad. Yeah, this was railroad ink we were talking about. Um, yeah. And apparently uh, Ravensburger still has St. Malo listed on their site, not available online, but available in stores for $36.99 MSRP. Okay, um, so so it's Ravensburger, Ravensburger, not not. It is still Aaliyah. I know that I got that part right. Yeah. I couldn't remember who published it in North America. Yeah, so it's a Ravensburger game that you can still buy. I like it. Like it's just it's heavy. It's a euro. Like it, it's a euro with a roll and write mechanic, and I dig that. Yep. And I, you now, know, have I've you played, played any? I played Railroad Inc. as well. Uh, again, not with the advanced uh, thing. I've only played the basic, and it was enjoyable. It was absolutely enjoyable. Again, that that shared pool is of yeah. dice is a nice. Um, a nice option. Um, it's just, it, it's something I just haven't gotten a lot into. And it's probably one of the few I've played is, is that, uh, well, what about, um, the one you guys did a preview for on Kickstarter with the museum that had Roll the, for lasers? the strange theme that didn't really fit. I like the game, but I hated the theme, right? Like I, it, it just, it had like art on there that made no sense. Like it just was illogical, but the actual mechanics were a lot of fun with the different mirrors and the laser right. that was roll for lasers, uh, which I think funded. I, to be honest, I don't know if I followed up after <laughs> doing our review. Roll for lasers was all right. I, I don't know if I consider it. Like, I think the other three are better. Um, roll for lasers though was surprisingly thinky once you got around the board a couple of yeah. times. It was no, neat absolutely. enough. And I never, due to um, COVID, never got to try it with more than two people. Right. So that was one of the other things. I really wanted to try that with with more players. And honestly, like I almost want to throw their board out and make my own on a sheet of graph paper. Yeah. Uh, now, if, as a follow-up to this, Jeff in the chat yeah. room asked. What is the appeal of a roll and write? I like board games because of the bits. I I don't know. I, I think some portability, um, usually easier to teach, easier to play. So they're quick. They're good filler games. Um, if portability is a big thing, right? Like none of these games that I've seen are huge, right? Like even St. Malo, Euro, it's uh, the Aaliyah small box games. It's the smallest board game box they make. It's the same size as uh, for sale and two by two and I'm, Drama blank on some of the other well-known small box Aaliyah games. I think that's a big part. Um, people like dice. They're, they're, 
people like the feel and rolling dice and the 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 push your luck element of hoping you get that thing you need that is a huge part people who like output randomness right well actually this is input randomness sorry you're gonna roll and then decide what to do with the dice but there is that random element of oh i just need especially like saint mallow i'm like oh i'm one cannon away from defending against the pirates do i get the cannon oh i didn't okay well if i can't get the cannon what can i do to mitigate the points i'm about to lose right it's it's that feeling and portability really is i mean you know, again, we'll go back to Yahtzee, which is kind of like the first, the, the first mega popular reel. Mm. Anyway. And really, you need a pencil, paper, and five dice, right? You don't yeah. need one of their fancy score sheets. Pretty much everyone knows all the scoring for, uh, for Yahtzee. Uh, so you don't need any special components. You just need dice. Um, and and that's, that goes a long way, especially, you know, if you're stuck at a cottage somewhere with the kids mm -hmm. and you just want to play a game... There's probably some dice lying around, especially if you're a role player. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. uh, you know, there's plenty of, of things you can play. But also, I mean, it's also just really easy to make up a new roll and write game. Well, you yeah. know? Again, if you're bored, you're stuck in on a rainy day and you've got some dice around, dice, a pencil and some paper, you can make up a game and put it on Itch.io and, and sell it to people. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's kind of the, the uh, convenience and the thrill of roll and rights and why there are so very many roll and rights uh, of varying qualities is because anyone can write them and i think that's awesome it lets everyone dip their toe into the game uh, market and it, uh, worth noting i think at this point is the three i mentioned do not use standard d6s they're all dice made specific for those games but there are a ton that just use like that that not so clever if i remember correctly it's just standard d6 dice although to be fair i mean with a crib sheet or yes, the roll, uh, like railroad ink doesn't need special dice. You just have to write down on your sheet beforehand. One is a left turn. Yeah. Two is a right turn or, or whatever. Totally fair. So, you know, they're, they're D6s. They just decided to make their own custom uh, symbols on them rather than make you figure it out. Yeah. So this is an AMA. And now I'm tempted to go on my board game geek list and look at my games <laughs> played and my ratings to see if I'm missing any. I probably am. I just know I haven't played any of the Wolf Game Wars ones. Like, those are big. There was one, uh, I think it's called Fitz or something. It was Tetris-based. That one looked really cool. That was, again, Stronghold Games that put that out. But again, I haven't played it. Like, I just, I, I almost feel like it's a gap in my gaming experience. But it's the kind of thing that, I, like, friends of mine got into. But, again, we're not gathering in public. So, so me, um, maybe Scott has gone out to get more on rights. And once we can get back together. I'll have played enough that I could actually do a full episode about it. So yeah, I wanted to cover that here because I'm like, at this point, we're never going to get to it on the full show because like I, I would just be Googling other people's top 10 roll and write games and refeeding the information, maybe doing a chart to figure out numbers and then telling you how great these games are I haven't played. And I don't like to do that. <laughs> Our entire thing would be three games and then 20 honorable mentions. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why we skipped that one. So Ryan asked, uh, Sean, what is the best worst most interesting birthday board game memories now to be honest uh i come from a very different sort of background than Moe's, so i don't have as many but honestly i go way way back and some of my favorite are actually i playing iq 2000 oh, back wow. in the day um that was just a fantastic um, youth-oriented version of trivial pursuit mm -hmm. it was a little bit more gamified uh and it it wasn't as general knowledge like you didn't have to be reading the new york times on a regular basis to be able to answer these questions uh because kids weren't uh but it really delved deeply into the sciences and things as well that that interested me at the time um and so yeah iq 2000 was was one that uh interesting we played often as uh back in the birthday um, i don't think i've ever played that game I, just wasn't one we had you had to have played it at my place at some point but I yeah. don't remember. I, I like. I can picture the game, yeah. like I've seen it, but I don't remember playing it. It's not one of the ones I remember. And then uh, I there's probably the other one is, and I can never remember the name of it. I'll have to. I'd have to go digging. Uh, do you remember the the game I had? It had the wizards and the toads, and the you were trying to save a, a princess from the dragon, and it's tokens with uh, wizards and toads and ogres, uh, and it's this old seventies magic game and we ended up hacking it and rewriting the magic system at one point because the game itself was kind of yeah but it was the the pieces were really interesting right now nah, off the top of my head like it sounds vaguely familiar but i think i think i wiped too many of my childhood <laughs> memories even gaming related 
Uh, what else we got? Um, coming up next, uh, we're going to dig back in here. So, Games for Music has a question. What is the most important game that results with new music being played? I got to say, I, I that is the most fascinating question I think we've ever <laughs> been asked. And I am hoping we got a bunch of people hanging out in the lobby that may be able to help us out here. Because I can honestly only think of one. And it's one I haven't played. So again, I'm doing the bad thing where I'm going off other people's opinions on a game. It's one I've been really tempted to pick up. And I am even drawing a blank on the stupid name of it right now. It was Hasbro Drop Mix. That is the name of the game. Mm. So Drop Mix. And it's this, it's a big plastic thing that you connect to your phone or an app or a, or a tablet or whatever. And you had these cards that had whatever chips in them or whatever. And it came with a bunch of different cards and they were all popular songs. Like I, you had uh, whatever Britney Spears song and you'd have uh, some other, I don't know. They were all family friendly songs. So there were no nasty lyrics in any of these. Actually, to be honest, here's how little I know, but I don't know if anything had lyrics. I think it was just the music. I'm pretty sure it was just like, like the beat from a, a popular song. And then you could buy expansion packs and there were tons of them. Like you could get soul, you could get jazz, you could get pop hits, Euro hits and all these things. And the game system came with a total, a ton of different games you could play. And from what I understand, it was most fun just goof around with it. But there were games where you like, you'd have a hand of cards and you try to play all your cards. And what would happen is you would put one card on the thing and it would play that beat right that that part of the song but then you would grab another song from a different artist and put it and you'd be trying to make music and it would create new songs because it would be a mashup of what you have out there and it was all about trying to like i said i know at least one of the games was play your hand so you would play a card and then everyone at the table would vote if the song got better or worse which actually sounded really neat so like you'd be like all right you got the and then someone else puts down a you're like, oh, that sounds cool. Okay, you get to keep play your card. And then it goes to the next person, and they play a card down. And then there was something about the position they were in mattered too. So I don't know if that was different parts of the songs or what. Um, and when they would get played, you'd be like, oh, no, no, that sounds worse. You'd have to take your card back. But like, there was a, at least five different ways to play, if not more, included in the box. So Drop Mix is the most uh, important was the question, but I would think that the most groundbreaking, like this was mass market. You could get this at Target, Walmart, uh, at Toys R Us at the, day, at the end of the day. And this literally generated new music as you played the game. What I would love to know, um, I don't see the chat room speaking up, so I don't think they know any, but if anyone out there knows any more, so this is another one I did. I'd love to do it as a full topic, but like that, I'd be talking about one game for half an hour that I honestly haven't played. Like I'd, I'd have to go out and find a copy of Drop Mix, buy it, so I could try it just to talk about it, and then maybe review Drop Mix. But I can't think of any others. Now I'm thinking there's got to be music-based RPGs out there. There's got to be some kind of improv, sitting around a campfire, past the stick music game, or something that's like with beatboxing. I just like I just figure someone's gonna have made that. But Googling it, like, I don't even know how to Google this. What's a game that results in new music being created? Like, it's not going to get you anywhere. And trust me, I tried. I just, like, maybe I had to deep dive itch, and maybe I'll find something on itch. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I can't say, I mean, I could, I'm sure there are a bunch of uh, music theory type games where, you know, people who actually know music and notes and, and musical notation things can like, you know, pass around right. cards with notes on, on them and do things like that. But no idea. See, um, that would sound cool too, right? Like if you had a handful of music notes, you put them down and the like my daughter could play that because she can read music. I have yeah. no clue. I could see that. Maybe that exists. Yeah. I mean, I'm now, sure, I'm sure there's a bunch of different kind of improv games for musicians uh, right. that exist. Um, like, is there a jazz game about making a jazz beat? Like, that's just a Hop Cat Jive Club or something? That's the name of the game. So, Axon Punk is one that um, Red Meeple Ryan brings up in the chat. It is an expanded hip hop infused cyberpunk TTRPG. <laughs> I'm looking to see how much. Uh, uh, so far, it sounds really neat. Fellow oh, city dwellers produce missions, get rewards. Players Wake will evolve over. I don't see anything that says anything about actually making kick pop. Except for yeah, I don't I don't see I don't see any mechanisms in the game for for making or creating hip hop. 
I mean, maybe it's in there, but I'm just scrolling quick. Your here. other option is if you're more of a musical theater type buff and you've got someone around who can play a piano, whose line is it anyway? Has some great inspiration for creating new songs, right? Oh, throw there down, you go. Throw yeah. down a background melody and randomly improv a song based on something someone you know pulls out of a hat or whatever. Um, Fair. There's you know whose line is it anyway has done some wonders for improv musical singing type. There stuff. you go. Yeah, if anyone out there has any, hit us up. Mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Let, let me know. Let me know if you can find a, a game that generates new music because uh, the concept then of it sounds really awesome. Rap Gods doesn't have any actual rap in it, right? It's a worker placement game. As far as I know, yeah. Yeah, like it doesn't really have that create new music aspect. Right. So, All right, I think I saw some new stuff from the chat. What do we got? I got a question here from Jeff. Uh, what is a game that you know it is going to hit the table for a lot of others when the world opens, but that you are not looking forward to? Oh, it's like backwards. <laughs> Popular game that everyone's going to be talking about and everyone's going to be all wild to play, but it just isn't your thing. Uh, well, I, I think people have finally moved past Scythe. <laughs> um, I, I think, like, I, I want to say Everdell, but it's not because it's not my thing. It's just because I didn't want to spend 360 Canadian to go all in. So Everdell is one that a bunch of people are going to be playing, but I don't know how soon that's going to deliver. But right. I don't know when we're going to end lockdown, so I may as well assume it's yeah. going <laughs> to deliver before we end lockdown at this point. So Everdell's one, but that, just because of the price, not because I don't want to play the game. It's, it's I did not, I... I the way the new Kickstarter was, yes, I could have just got the base game, but I would have wanted to get everything if I was going to do it at all. So that's one. I would love to play. Uh, I, I, I think there's going to be a lot of people playing Everdell getting delivered. Um, there's uh, the, the big one that everyone's going nights right now for is a Stonemaier game, Red something. And I know nothing about that. So again, this is just a point of me not being informed on what the game's about. So I don't care, but everyone seems to be going nuts for Red that. Red Rising? Red Rising, that's it. So yeah, Red Rising. That's um, hand the, management combo building game based on the futuristic dystopian novels by Pierce Brown. Oh, there you go. See, it's based on a popular license. Okay, that makes more sense why there's so much buzz. But it's just, I don't know anything about it. So, eh. I don't, I don't really care either way. So I guess this was a, sorry, a follow-up. We, we missed yeah, the first no, part I, of the we, question. We, we did. We missed the original. Well, let's finish this one. We'll yeah. finish this. We'll finish the, the, the second part of the question. So uh, another one is Tainted Grail. Tainted Grail, I know insider info possibly, just showed up at distributors. And local game stores can order it and get it in as of right now. It is looking at $240 Canadian to get this game in. Um, that is from one of our local game stores, uh, Tabletop Renaissance, Solon Store. Feel free to check it out, Google it if you want. Uh, as far as I know, they might even ship other places than in Windsor. And I don't know how that price compares to anyone else. I just know the price that they will be selling it at. That's not, that's not their price, it's the price you would pay. And that was meant to be the Gloomhaven killer, according to everyone who backed it on Kickstarter. And I am really curious to see how well that pans out. But again, $240. Canadian for one game. Yeah. Like, like, I don't care if it's bigger than Gloomhaven. I can play it for three years. I still have Gloomhaven and I haven't finished it after playing for two years. And that only cost me under 90 bucks. Yeah. So it, it's just too big. Plus, it looks to be too big. It looks like it's trying to do too much at once. Uh, it's the problem that, that that Kickstarter you were looking at that you almost backed. It looks like it has similar problems. It's trying to be too big of adventure, too big of a game. So, so that's another one that I think people are going to be playing, but I won't be part of. Um, uh, Armada, Star Wars Armada, they just dropped a, like a new, not a new edition, but their Atomic Mass is finally putting out their version and their updates and their, their versions of the ships. And that's a game where I didn't play my original copy enough times, so I don't think I'm going to get into it. But I don't think that's going to be one everyone's going to be playing. Right. Talk I got to say, welcome back to the chat, Shadzar. It has been a long time. It's been quite a while. Uh, they're having a chat about uh, the uh, versions purchased of Hero Quest. Um, oh yeah, I went all in on that. I will be playing Hero Quest <laughs> along with everyone else. Yeah. Whenever that shows up, I will be playing that, and I'll be showing it off at the local stores if I if I can get out there. So yeah, I will definitely be playing that one. Yeah, it'll be interesting. And you know, like there's some of the Simon stuff where it's like, yeah, 
it's, yeah, it's interesting. That's that's stuff where I, I again most of those games I'd happily play once, but I wouldn't ship I wouldn't shell out the money to play them, you know, over and over and over again because yeah. they just I don't feel like they have that much into them. Um uh other games that I'm trying to think of uh the chat's flooding in. Yep. Welcome everyone. Hey folks, and thanks to uh again to everyone who's uh saying hi to so, hi. Uh, hi and happy birthday. I appreciate it. Um talking you were talking about price and I was reminded about the uh the cost to ship the uh Oh yes. <laughs> uh Shopify has a standard um shipping system that's the, that's a plug in to their to their Shopify thing and it's it's USPS, UPS um pricing and it's something it, it appears to just take the raw weight of a parcel from your your SKU and mm. slap it into a formula and a deck builder we were recommending to someone came out to between 56 or a hundred dollars to ship yeah. just a tiny little deck builder it's not a big game at all but yeah so shopify work on your work on your shipping rates uh but anyway so a follow-up or the the original yeah, question the original. to jeff's uh what game are you not looking forward to everyone playing is what is the first game you want to get to the table at a public play event when the world reopens oh there we go see that was the question i was expecting when you said <laughs> the other one. Oh man that's rough a public play i think i'm gonna go with potentially our review for later today reef or space space i think one of them they're both easily accessible games they're light they're they're family friendly they're, they're a public play game especially reef for its, its physicality that's a game i'm going to set up on the table at uh at, uh cg realm or maybe at uh easy mode or somewhere local maybe we'll be back at coffee shops and people are going to come over and go what's that and then i'm gonna say no just sit down and play it's simple i can teach you in five minutes let's go and then second will be space base because it's it's another it's a step up right it's it's definitely not as light but it's still pretty accessible basic mechanics are roll 2d6 and get something then use that what you got to buy more cards every turn you're getting a new card in that game so unlike valeria and other um dice driven resource generation games every round you are swapping a ship every time every time though i gotta admit later in the game there are reasons not to if you have very little money but in general it's it's a great engine builder and it shows that off well those are probably the two games that i got most recently that i'm excited to show off to the public next up actually you know what no space space push it one this goes first fun fair so simple and quick but feel so deep so Funfair, that might that jumps to second. So Reef and Funfair, depending on how experienced the gamers are to sit at my table the first game we play when we go to a local game store. So I'm going to sit down, and depending on who sits with me, if it's someone who's like used to playing Terraforming Mars with me and stuff, we're breaking out Funfair. If it's someone that's like, oh, this is my first time coming out to a gaming event, what, what do you got? Then I'm going to break out Reef. And then the next, maybe we'll play Space Base or we'll swap to the other game. That, that's, my, that's my thoughts. Uh, my two, uh, depending on when they show up, uh, I've got, I was just looking at my backer list to, to see what, <laughs> what I'm expecting. And um, Studies in Sorcery is one that I'm really looking forward to. And that's uh, uh, sort of a, a take on Harry, a Harry Potter concept uh, deck builder set card game that's interesting. And then I did go all in for the Hoop Gods with Rap Gods second printing. Uh, and I'm looking to see how that okay. one, how that one goes, and I think that one will actually look good out on a public play table as well. So that'll probably come down to uh, no. Windsor with me at some point. All right, I'm going to twist the question a bit, and I'll ask you first, and then maybe I'll answer separate, or maybe I'll just ask you if you could make it down to Windsor, what's the game we should play first? Oh God, <laughs> that is always such a brutal question. Uh, probably Eclipse. Okay. I'll have to remember that. Yeah. that that's a big I mean, one. Yeah, no, but exactly. To play that with more than that's two. one of those things that we don't do. We don't tend to do big ones yeah. uh, because we want to get so many games in. Uh, yeah. And so we, we have in, we generally avoided most of the epic, you know, let's sit down and play this game for six hours or four hours or however many right. hours because wouldn't it be more fun to play these six games <laughs> um, and sleep? But... Uh, 
Fair enough. All right. So the one I want to play with you the most is Aventuria, but that's self-serving. It's, it's one we have to review. You read the yep. rules. Yep. I want to play that with at least three people. Aventuria for Pile of Obligation and Space Base for, oh my God, it's so good. You have to try this. Right. And again, so those two. I read the, I read, yeah. I read the, the rules for Space Base and we just never got, we didn't fit it. it in. Yep. We didn't fit it in. We convinced you to play a word gaze puzzle game instead, which worked <laughs> out really well. All right, the chat's flooding with questions now. Uh, absolutely. So I've got uh, here. We're gonna go off topic because we don't we don't we don't do topics on our AMA. So from Matt yes. FKG, off topic AMA question: What is the favorite Windsor pizza? Oh, there's so many good ones. <laughs> um, to, in general, if 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 money is not an option, in general, it's it's a toss up depending on who's been better lately. To be honest. Um, if, if it still exists, it would be in-person Capri Pizza on Google Road. The problem is they closed the restaurant part. And this had nothing to do with COVID. Before COVID hit, they decided the restaurant portion wasn't doing well enough and that they were going to do takeout and delivery only. That was the best pizza in the city, in my opinion. And I share pictures of it. They even did this thing where they braided the crust a bit. Like, it was fantastic. Now, delivery Capri is usually good, but every now and then it's not. And we're getting it from Forest Glade because that's the closest one to our place. So, yeah. so I, I want to say Capri, but it, uh, I want old Capri. I don't want my 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 Forest Glade Capri. I want the Dougal Pizza Capri, which I can won't deliver to our house because it's too far away. Second, though, and more consistent for pizza, no, only for pizza, based on some of my current uh, social media feeds, is Windsor Pizza itself on Jefferson. They are consistently fantastic for the pizza, best toppings. They have the best sausage that's that small, bald, fennelly, bald? Yeah, bald is in like rolled into a ball. Ball like fennelly sausage is amazing. When you ask for extra cheese, you actually get extra cheese. They slice the pepperoni perfect. They even make pizzas that Deanna likes with all kinds of toppings. I don't want on my pizza. My mom loves Windsor pizza. I would recommend them for other things, but I unfortunately can't do that right now. And I don't know if it's new management or what, but the pizza has still been stand up. So those, those are my two favorite Windsor style pizza pizzas, but there are other options, right? Uh, here in Windsor, you can also get wood fire pizza and wood fire pizza. I love oven 360. It's fast food pizza. It's like going to subway. You walk in, you pick a crust size, you pick it. If you want whole wheat or white or gluten-free, and then you literally like, like subway, look at all the toppings. Go, I want some of that and some of that and some of that. And you can get different sauces and you could get, um, uh whatever you, you do like an arabiata or you can do like uh just oil and garlic or you can do the alfredo and then they put it in this special oven and this is why it's called oven 360 where your pizza goes around the inside of the oven 360 degrees and when it gets the other side it's perfectly cooked and they have like a whole bunch going they said it's like fast food so i play amazing but it's not windsor style at all it is a completely different when i go there i'm getting um capicolo and and prosciutto on my pizza i'm not getting you know double cheese pepperoni italian sausage so that's my favorite place for that um downtown there's terracotta pizza if you want gourmet uh hand tossed wood fire amazing food um deep dish then you go to armando's and you have to hit the one on cabana road or the new one in amisburg and you get dean lister the pizza king to make you a deep dish pizza is detroit style deep dish or they have windsor style deep dish but the detroit style deep dish roni rubber is one of the best pizzas i ever had in my mouth i love it but again it's not windsor style so like there's so many options what i generally avoid is the the pizza pizzas the dominoes of course but a lot of the, the pizza plus the the cheaper pizzas where you can get a large pizza for 10 bucks those i usually don't like um i like antonino's but antonino's a lot spicier sauce and they do the thing where you get the cornmeal on the bottom of the crust and i actually don't like the texture of that but i love their toppings like i just yeah, wish I, they I do, I do love it i do love a good cornmeal on the uh... yeah see some people love it so so they're up there but i personally think windsor pizza is better so yeah, we got we got a, a ton of different. <laughs> I'm a, you know types. I'm a big fan of Capri. Um, it's it's hard to go wrong with Capri, and I I when I'm uh, I w I will on occasion if I'm visiting my my grandfather in Lakeshore, there's the Capri in the plaza right on Manning and uh, Manning Road there, and I'll and I'll swing by yep. and grab one to go for the drive home. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Capri's consistent. Usually, it's, it's just oh, yep. the one the one on Dougal where you ate in was always so good. Yep. Plus, then you got to eat in, and you could get like my mom could get a, a, a chicken parm, and 
uh, someone else would get a lasagna or whatever the kids would get whatever they wanted and that it was better for that but unfortunately that's no longer an option as i doubt it'll ever come back at this point uh how, how is Sarducci? i maybe you missed it i was uh, Sarducci. Uh, Sarducci's it... to me is still on that cheaper end right it's okay. the cheaper pizza that's really good for the price but it's not my favorite pizza. What I used to love from Sarducci's is they had a deal where you got two mediums with six toppings and you could pick and mix and match. So I would just get like mine with pepperoni and cheese and then Dee would be able to get five toppings on her medium, right. which worked out really well. And that's what we've done all the game nights you came down for, like when we do New Year's or whatever. And that way I, I, we pair up. So every group of two people would get, would get a pizza to split. And it was dirt cheap. Well, not dirt cheap, but it was it was very reasonably priced. They use pretty good toppings. I just I find their crust isn't as good, and their sauce is just like I, I feel like they're using a canned sauce, which they may or may not be. Yeah, I don't. Know. It's just not as nice as some of the other ones. We my but family okay. had I'd gotten in the habit years ago now, but uh, I had gotten in the habit of the uh, Sarducci's kitchen sink pizza, which yeah. was like the whole tomato, like you know the whole tomato slices and everything on it, uh, and that was a, that was a big go to. That's I mean that's. The topping style of there there because starts drifting away from the official Windsor style when you start doing yes. the kitchen sink, but uh, always uh, always solid pizza there. Uh, and my dad knew knew the owner, so I think we got this. right. <laughs> um, so we we did it for years until they left, got rid of that deal, and then it became right. just as pricey as ordering Windsor pizza, and then they'd rather have Windsor pizza. Well, and it's one of those That's things where you know they, they've changed over time. Like, you know, Sam's used to be the, the oh Windsor, Sam's the best place, pizza in Windsor. Sarducci's yeah. was fantastic pizza in Windsor, but yeah. over the time the uh, Sam's the owners is, have is changed definitely, and things. Yeah. Sam's is definitely new owners with a new, different flavor. Yeah. And we, we have had some bad experiences there, so we don't even try. Yeah. But Sam's, man, when they looked like an Italian restaurant with the white and red oh, uh, yeah. checkered tablecloths yeah, 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 and yeah. like the, when, we, when the Ingrata family was owning it. When you walked yeah, in, yeah. the Ingrata family owned yeah. it. Yeah. That, that Sam's was the best at one time. They had the best panzos too. Oh, and they mean, deliver them like really early in the morning sometimes too. <laughs> I remember getting 3 a.m. panzos. And I just, I just happened to live like down the street from yeah. Sam. So that was, that was where we went to. I mean, that's what I knew pizza wow. of pizza was. I mean, I remember the first time when I had like pizza, pizza, garbage yeah. pizza. And, and you're like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. What is this? Oh. All right. Uh, we are at AMA, so we talked a bit about pizza. Let's absolutely. get. We got, no we got some other questions. I, the chat is there's going by a, so quick, I can't read it. There's been a lot of Gloomhaven so it's awesome. and Frosthaven chat. Uh, a lot of people were kept going on about Hero Quest. Uh, Ryan had asked me about Hoop Gods, and I'm like, yes. So Hoop Gods and Rap Gods should be delivering at the same time for me. I got in who nice. with Hoop Gods and the second printing of Rap Gods in one package. Um, yeah the talk about hero quest is yeah we played through the original that was a game that uh, i played with deanna when we were dating we played through that uh good night jeff uh head not yeah, good night, jeff. um boo, boo, boo. uh josh lion entry excellent onboarding the best yes. way to learn gloom, any gloomhaven if you're yeah. playing any gloomhaven start with jaws of the lion yeah, Jaws of the Lion, definitely. If you're getting into Gloomhaven now, start there. Even Frosthaven. Play it before you play Frosthaven. Yeah. Jaws of the Lion is fantastic. Standalone game. Very well done. Great onboarding while still being quite difficult. Like, it it definitely ramps up. Uh, Gloomhaven, people have to realize, Gloomhaven is not Hero Quest. It is, it's, they're in totally different categories. It's, it's, it's almost like two different approaches to the same thing, right? You're both a dungeon crawl. But like one is a one versus many where someone's playing the the, the dungeon master, except they're not because they're trying to win. So you have someone playing the monsters versus playing the characters. And it's super light, like you can all move the exact number of squares and you're just rolling a bunch of dice looking for hit symbols and highly random. And you're rolling on random tables and maybe getting some spells that, that, that fix the rules a little bit or, or change the rules a little bit. Whereas Gloomhaven is actually a very heavy puzzle game that's all about optimizing your turn and managing your hand. And it, it's a completely different feel. Like, like, yes, you're both exploring a dungeon, but one's solving a puzzle where the other's having an adventure. Uh, it literally is that the scale of Euro to Ameritrash, if such a thing still exists. And we talked about before how nowadays everything's so mashed, it doesn't really matter. But Hero Quest is very much on the Ameritrash side and Gloomhaven is very much on the Euro side of things. Uh, so we got a question from Shadzar. Again, great to see you back in the chat. Uh, what about those retro crossover games like TMNT and Ghostbusters as a board game? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure exactly which ones because there's so many different versions out there. <laughs> um, the Ghostbusters game I have was another one of those big Kickstarter 
it might have been cool mini or not it might not have i can't remember off the top of my head there was tons of miniatures and there were all these stretch goals to unlock more miniatures and you could get additional chapters and you could unlock the exo ex, uh, the ecto one miniature and they put out a, an expansion with um uh, i can't even remember the state puff marshmallow one was the one bad guy but it came up there was another bad guy you could get um and it was okay. I, it was a cooperative game where you play the Ghostbusters against the others. And like I said, I think it's the same people who did Zombicide. And I think you can see the Zombicide roots in it. And we had some fun with it, but it was it was okay. Deanna liked it way more than I did. She actually really got into it, thought it felt really good. And I just, I, I kept it because she liked it more than anything. So it was okay. But I doubt that's the one he's talking about. So apparently there's a Ghostbusters uh, versus Men in Black Ecto Terrestrial Invasion crossover yeah. game. That's one I haven't, uh, I haven't run across. Yeah, I don't know that one. So sorry, I cannot uh, talk to that because I've never heard of it. Um, then the, the, the TMNT miniature game, which is another one that was, I, this one was IDW. Well, so is this one actually. Okay, so the, the original was IDW, the ghost, uh, the TMNT one, and there wasn't enough in the base box. Again, it was a big Kickstarter with all these expansions. You could get you could get April O'Neil, and you could get Splinter, and you could get additional chapters and everything, and I didn't. All I did was buy the retail version when it came out, and I was highly disappointed because the scenarios were just lame. Like, your first scenario was you're in this alley, and you fight a bunch of foot soldiers, and then a lieutenant comes out, and then the next one is you're, like, in a warehouse, and you fight more, and then the next one is you're in a bigger warehouse, and eventually, like, I, Bebop or Rocksteady or someone shows up. And that was it. There was, like, four chapters. Maybe it was six. But, like, you could play through that in an afternoon. So I was like, what? That was, like, there's just not enough in that base box. Now, what that game did do is that had a fantastic co-op rule where you had a pool of dice and you would roll them and there would be things like skateboards to move and nunchucks to hit. And I, I don't remember all the different symbols on them, shells to defend or something like that. And you would line your dice up in front of you in a row and the die on the far right and the die on the far left, you shared with the other players. So if I put a hit in my far right, the person to my right could use my hit and whatever they put in their far left, I could use. And I thought that was a brilliant way to add a cooperative element to a miniature game. But I think for that game to go anywhere, they needed to make more. They needed to keep going with it. So regarding the Ghostbusters versus Men in Black Echo, Ecto, ter, Ecto Terrestrial Invasion IW game, just taking a quick little look at it. Uh, my first, the first strike against it for me personally is Chibi Miniatures. It's just not a style I enjoy especially when they're recreating characters from my past that I have a fondness for in that style. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a fine style for original art, but I don't like seeing my, my favorite characters recreated that way. Yeah. Um, now, they do have an interesting um, mechanic in this game. The firehouse has been recreated into a system not all, un not all that unlike a dice tower cross of um the um, cube tower from wallenstein no um no. the um but the marble drop from uh, oh tower of madness tower of Kukon? madness so it is dice inside of it and so but as you pull things out of the the towers a certain number of dice come down and roll to determine what goes out onto the map hmm. so it's an interesting little mechanic that they put together for that and it's a nice looking piece but you combine that with the chibi and I, I don't know. It, I don't know if it has a lot of, it's, it's probably got a lot of table presence for a public right. event, but replayability eh, does again, doesn't really do anything for me uh, when you add up some of the. My guess aspects. is it's probably based on a comic book because most of the IDW stuff is because they are a comic book publisher as well, but I don't know. Well, they get all the license to licenses to like everything. Oh yeah. Everything. It is, um, it is. And I, I'm sorry to say this, but most of the IDW games aren't that great in my experience. The ones I have played have not so been great. So they're aiming to look, capture the look and feel of a Saturday morning cartoon. But I, I guess that's new Saturday morning cartoons because none of my Saturday morning yeah, cartoons they're, they're, were chibi. Yeah. Um, All right. So the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, uh, Ryan is saying it's cryptozoic. No, it's IDW games. I was right. So Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shadows of the Past is the one I played. That is IDW games. Um, and what was the other one I mentioned before? What did we talk about before TMNT? Ghostbusters? Ghostbusters, yeah. Wow. <laughs> John, a blank. 
2015 yeah 2015 yeah i, th- I think a lot of these, these that versions. one's cryptozoic yeah okay. so ghostbusters is cryptozoic and see, it looks like a cool mini game i gotta say it really does um so that one was cryptozoic and the team mt was so they're not from the same people at all i i have to say I'll, you know people are starting to get a little greedy and and this ghostbusters men in black yecto terrestrial invasion is look sony's got a bunch of licenses and they want to get them out on the market. They don't mm. want to necessarily make a Ghostbusters game, but if they make a Ghostbusters and Men in Black game, they can double their market. Uh, you know, they're going to get all those hardcore board, board gaming fans from both those. Uh, That's what they're people. hoping. Yes. They're hoping anyway. So you know, it's it's a smart move. Again, the hardcore fans will probably love it and buy in, but your average gamer, whether or not they're going to go for that, is is really dependent mm-hmm. on how much the style that they've decided to go with really catches your attention and, and, and moves you to me, for me, mm-hmm. it's not, uh, not something that's going to do it. All right. I think we got time for one more. If I don't see something from the chat, we'll pick, I think this one from our backlog. Right. Cause it kind of, we kind of talked about this yeah, a little yeah. bit, but I think it's a little bit more specific or we could throw this on, but this, this, I think it didn't take too long. Yeah, no, I think, so I, I think that yep. one. All right. So All we're, right. we're, we're, we're giving you a chance in the chat though. Feel free to ask something. We'll, we'll do yours instead. That's what we're here for tonight. Yeah. Um, again, awesome to see so many people in the chat, including some new people. That's awesome. And some old, I, I don't want to say old timer because I don't mean it that way, but <laughs> people we haven't seen in a while and are yes, coming happy back. to have back. So yeah, there are a couple other standalone TMNT games that use that system. So that's cool because that is the system was awesome. But like we played that TMNT Shadows of the Past at Brimstone Games and literally played the whole campaign. And I'm like, I don't feel like fighting this again to see if I could do better. Like it just didn't have that play it multiple times kind of thing. I, I got rid of it or I'm going to get rid of it. I can't remember <laughs> which right now. It's one of the two. It's it's either on the pile to get rid of or I already got rid of it. I don't remember which. I don't see it on the pile that's in this room right. to get rid of. All right. Well, we're going to finish up with this question from Bryce Henderson, okay. who asks, what Kickstarters are you most looking forward to its fulfillment? All right. I'm going to broaden it, say which crowdfunded, just in case, because mm-hmm. part of me wants to say Hero Quest, but to be honest, it's not Hero. Uh, it's, uh, you know what it is? If we're going to stay in lockdown for much longer, it's Hero Quest. Right. I want Hero Quest because I want to play that with my girls. I want to play it with Deanna again and experience it again. I'm going to be really tempted to start painting again when it shows up. I'm going to want to steal the scenery from it and use it in our Gloomhaven game. So I am really looking forward to Hero Quest, but that's only if we're stuck at home. If we can get out and I can actually get other people here, I really want to play Worldwide Wrestling Second Edition. I, I am itching to run a role playing game. Uh, if I had to do non Kickstarters, it's one of the other ones I've reviewed in the last couple of years that we haven't gotten to play. But I really want to play Worldwide Wrestling. I particularly like to play it at a con. I would love to go to Breakout and play some Worldwide Wrestling or start a game locally. I've had a couple people definitely say they really want to play it locally. And I like maybe we do this on 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 Zoom or something. I don't know, but there's a lot of physicality to the new edition that I think is going to not work as well online. But we'll see. So Worldwide Wrestling Second Edition from Nathan D. Paoletta uh, would be my number one Kickstarter I'm looking forward to getting as long as I can actually play it with someone. <laughs> Whereas Hero Quest would be the number one crowdfunded game I want to show up now so I could start playing it with my girls and with Deanna. So yeah, I, I am waiting most patiently. Uh, you already said Worldwide Wrestling, so I'm not going to say that because yeah. I'm waiting for that as well. Uh, that should be That is shipping, actually. Um, oh, see, I didn't, I didn't notice the reason. I, I believe cool. he, I believe that is in, in shipping right now. So we should be seeing that. Uh, my next one is, is kind of a hesitant. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to see it, but I'm also hesitant. And that is galaxies in peril, which mm. is the forged in the dark superhero uh, version of worlds in peril. Uh, and worlds in peril, as we discussed on our previous episode about supers, uh, had some good potential, but also had some real drawbacks to it. So yeah. I just kind of, I, I really, I'm really hoping this Galaxy in Peril um, knocks it out of the park and, and turns into the solid supers game that I want it to be. Um, whereas I think Hoop Gods and Rap Gods are something that I will actually play with my kids. So mm-hmm. when those show up, I can get those to the table uh, right away, unlike, unlike uh, Galaxy in Peril. 
So why is it called Galaxy in Peril? Like to me, that sounds sci-fi. It's not they, super well, it, they've they've expanded it, so it, it's it's not just the city. It's not local heroes. It's it's more. They, they've opened it up to a more. So it's like potentially that cosmic, cosmic potentially cosmic. They've allowed. Uh, they've apparently allowed it for more cosmic threats and not just you know stuck in the city because masks is is generally a very oh, yeah. city based yes. uh, thing. You're not you're not going. In, uh, yeah, you you are street level world. heroes. Well, okay. you're high school level yeah. heroes. Um, and I mean, you may be powerful, but you're not you're not powerful and known enough to be going helping in other countries. Whereas Galaxy in Peril, you're supposed to be playing a super team. You're 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 JLA level sort of right. kind of stuff. All right, that makes sense. I just I, I got to say the branding's off. Like if I see that, I think I don't think Guardians of the Galaxy I, or or Green Lantern. I think Star Wars, yeah, right? No, I, the galaxy's under attack. I need to defend it and defeat the evil empire. Like yeah. that, that's what that brings to mind for me. That's like of all all games, the one that totally confused me is Scum and Villainy. <laughs> like I totally get that's a Star Wars reference, and I yep. should recognize that as a Star Wars reference. But I thought it was a game about playing rogues and thieves. <laughs> like I, I literally thought it was like like a, yep. a heist game, like a, a a bad guy heist, not not a you know you're heisting for the good reasons. But I actually thought it was like pickpockets and and thieves guilds and doing all this stuff. And then someone's like blah blah blah, the sci-fi is Star Wars based. I'm like Star Wars based. What the heck? Why is it Star Wars based? Yeah. And then someone's a den of scum and villainy, the most a wretched hive of scum and villainy. <laughs> and I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> like it just whew, right over my head. Yeah. I totally missed that. And then, then once I learned more about the game, I'm like, I want to try that game. But that definitely was branded and I, I guess that was smartly branded. I guess it makes sense to most people, but I totally missed it completely. I'm like, scum and villainy. This is like, you know, Thardon's Thieves Guild and Warhammer <laughs> is what you're gonna be playing out. Not not an intergalactic right. uh space uh renegades or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> all right. Alrighty. I think that's about all we're going to get to tonight. Um, we've been doing this for a long enough time, I think. So thank you very much, everyone in the chat room, for your questions. It's been a great lobby tonight. Thank you to all the lobbyists who joined us tonight. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, you don't have to wait for an AMA. Head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Tonight, we're taking a look at Reef, an abstract game about building a coral reef. All right, Reef was designed by Emerson Matsuchi and features art by Chris Quilliams. It was originally published in 2018 by a number of different publishers. My personal copy is from Next Move Games, which is a department of Plan B games. Now, there is a second edition of this game that was published later back in... Uh, not too long ago, 2020, which features more contrast on the player boards and more colorblind friendly pieces. Uh, that was also put out by Next Move Games and Plan B Games. Now, the one we're reviewing tonight is the original printing, the first edition, but the rules and component quality are identical. All there are some changed colors. So everything that applies in this review should apply completely to the second edition of the now, this is, as I said, an abstract strategy game for two to four players, a full game taking, especially when you're learning the game, at least 30 minutes uh, to 45 minutes and possibly longer with more players. They pick up a copy of Reef for MSRP of $39.99, and it can also often be found on sale. For a look at the components in the original printing, be sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, again, I do want to point out the only thing that actually changes between the first and second edition is the colors. So that's just do a quick Google on what the new colors look like, and the unboxing should be still just as valid. Now, I got to say, I was impressed by this game opening this box. Now, I've seen the game online many times, and I've seen people sharing about it. This isn't a new game, right? 2018. Um, and it just looked cool. I had... I was still shocked by the component quality of it. Like even seeing the pictures, I didn't realize how thick and chunky and tactile the reef pieces are in this game. Like they, uh, someone else pointed this out on Twitter and I have to agree. They look like toddler toys. Like they look like something your kids could play with. And to be honest, I probably would have gave this to my kids to play with when they were toddlers. Like this is the kind of thing you probably, it doesn't, they're choking hazards and would be easy to clean if they Now, of course that's not, care about for the board game aspect but i thought the the pieces impressed me more than i expected with this are some well-designed cards and what i love about these cards is they're very simple there's two pieces a picture of two types of reef on the top and then there's a little scoring thing on the bottom and that's it they're very clear to read they're easy to read across the table 
Now, a bonus component wise was the box insert. Uh, this is a, a plastic molded insert that not only holds everything when stored, but also works as a good storage solution and container holder at the table when you're playing. Uh, for one, you could re leave the reef bits into their four spots, which works okay, but I actually prefer to dump those out, just put the extras back in the box, because otherwise you got to find somewhere to put the extras you're not using. But what I really like is their system for holding the money in the game, which is a number of different denomination cardboard chips. It's got a spot for each different denomination, so it's really easy to grab what you want. So I dig it, because not only is this insert good for putting the game away, it's actually useful during play. So, like uh, toddler toys, these bright, fun shapes are the sort of things that your kids will want to put inside their mouth. Mm -hmm. now, Very fair. What is it we're doing with all these chunky pieces and cards? All right. So the theme of Reef is you are building a very a, a variable. The word's <laughs> coming out wrong. You are building a, a I want to say barrier reef, but there are other types of reefs. You are building a reef of coral. The game comes with four different colors of coral that are four different shapes, and you are physically going to stack these on top of each other to make a physical reef in front of you. The theme of the game is who can build the best reef. Uh, it is an abstract strategy game. That theme could have been anything else. But you know what? It works with the colors and the pieces. It, it's, it could be anything else you're building, but it does a reef. Uh, the the pieces are reminiscent of reef pieces, but again, I don't think the or specific types of coral or anything like that. Now, to start the game, you're going to take the player boards. You're going to find one with a starfish on it. You're going to grab additional boards for up to four players, flip them over, shuffle them, and hand them out to the players. You're then going to flip them back over. You're going to remove a number of coral from the game if playing with less than four players. When you're playing with four players, you play with everything, but if it's less players, you take out some of each color. You're then going to take one of each color of coral. So again, there's four different types, four different colors. You're going to take three coins and two cards, and you're not going to keep the cards to yourself. They're face down. Don't face down to each player. And then you're going to build the market in Reef. And what you're going to do is you are going to flip three face-up cards, put them in the center of the table, and then put the deck next to that face up. So that's something you don't see in many games. And I got to admit, every time I play this game, I put the deck face down first, and then remember and flip it over. Now, after looking at your cards, players are going to place four coral on the board, their board. So the board is a four by four grid, and you have one of each coral type, you have to put it. Now, the first few games, you're going to put these in the middle four squares, and that's meant to give you some starting patterns and make things easier. But once everyone knows the game, you're now relegated to putting it on the outside edge only, which gives it, makes it a little more difficult to get started. Right, and you can see what you might be able to collect since you've already put that market out there and what you might be able to score. So right from the very mm -hmm. start, you need to be planning for the future. Yes. Now, once everyone's ready, the player with the starship, starship? I am messing up my words tonight. The player with the starfish starts the game. So there you go, Sean, a nice arbitrary start player system that doesn't reward someone for, you know, being young or older going swimming. Yep. Now, each turn, you do one thing. That's it. You either take a card from the market or you play a card from your hand. Now, we'll start with taking cards. So what you're going to do is you're going to look at the market. So it includes the face-up card on the top of the deck and three more and take one into your hand. Now, if you do take the top card of the deck, there is a penalty. You're going to have to pay one coin. That comes from your coins. This is why you start with three points in this game. Why you start with three coins is so that you can do that at the beginning of the game. This coin doesn't go back to the bank, but instead goes on the lowest cost card still in the market. No, you can collect any number of cards. There's no hand limit in this game. So this is your future. This what this card you're buying. You need to grab cards while keeping the scoring patterns you already have in your hand for future play in mind so mm -hmm. that you can maximize that scoring as you're going ahead and you're not going to end up stomping on your own plans. Yes. <laughs> so that is when we get to playing a card where you can mess up big time. So what you're going to do is take one of the cards that you either got at the start of the game or you drafted and you're going to place it face up in front of you. Now, every card shows two coral at the top of the card. Sometimes they're the same coral, sometimes they're different. The bottom of the card shows a scoring pattern. When you play, you're going to do both parts of the card. 
the first thing you do is to take coral. You do the top of the card first. It's simple. Take two of that coral and put them on your reef. Put them on your board. Now, again, I mentioned the board's a four by four board. So when you place new coral, you can either put it in a blank spot or on top of your existing coral. Now, stacks of coral are limited to going a max of four high. So you do have an upper limit. Second, after you put your new pieces on, you're going to score your reef. You're going to score the bottom part of the card. And each card shows a different pattern. And what you're going to do is look down on your reef from the top. So all you see is the top coral, because that's all that matters. So the top coral on every stack sets the, the color. And then you're going to count how many unique times the pattern on the card can be seen in your reef, where each piece of coral can only be used once. You're then going to multiply that. So the number of times the pattern shows up by the number on the card. And easy patterns are going to be worth like one points, whereas hard patterns are going to be worth like five points. Now, the different patterns include all kinds of different combos of coral. You got two of the same color side by side, two of the same color diagonal, three in a straight line, three diagonal, squares of four colors, L shapes, stacks at different heights, like for every coral you have at height two is going to score points, or stacks at certain heights of certain colors. So how many stacks of four that are red you have and so on there's a ton of different ones and the biggest learning curve in this game is learning these different patterns and showing them off which i just take the deck i flip it face down and i start throwing them out on the table and explaining how they work the most difficult one though like that, that sounds complicated but the most difficult one is just based on the number of coral you have in one color next to your highest stack of another color so you're going to look at the card and it's going to say like I, I, forget, I even forget what the icon is for highest of green. I think it's an up arrow. And you'll have like up arrow green with red. So you're going to find your highest stack of green and then count how many reds are around it. That's the most complicated one. And the one that I like to do a couple of examples. In addition to be able to give examples myself, the book itself, the rule book, which is like four pages long, has a bunch of these examples of all the different pattern types. So if you're having a problem visualizing it, you can always look in the book. And now one of the things only using each coral once is very different from the scoring in many similar types of games. Mm -hmm. So you can't just take, you know, I need to get an L shape of red. And so I've got the center one is red and I've got an L here and an L here and an L here and an L here. You can't do that because they're all based off that same single one. And so you need to yes. plan to spread out your shapes rather than building off of a, a central and just sort of spiraling around in that way. And that, that that's, uh, different than a lot of games like this mm -hmm. score. Yeah, most notably, actually, it's very different from Azul, which this is actually, this game is often considered the follow-up to Azul. It's a different designer, same publisher, and it's a similar style. So yes, Azul, you want to get that. And it uses what we call, I like to call Scrabble scoring, where you want to use the same letters more than once. Well, in this one, you cannot use reef tiles more than once or reef pieces. So the game continues back and forth or around the table, depending on the number of players, until the last coral of one of the four colors is taken. You then finish the round, and the game ends. Players then get the one last chance to score the cards left in their hands, but you only get to count having the pattern once. So if you have an L and you have two Ls on your board, you can just go, oh, I have an L. So I get the, the single point. You don't get to do any multipliers. Then you add up everyone's coins, how many points they have, and whoever has the most wins. Another simple game with some complex emergent difficulty. And one of yes. the interesting things uh, about this one is you can really uh, hurt your opponent by dragging out the game. That yeah. the way the game ends matters in this one because if they think, you know, the other player is expecting you to grab that and they think you're, they're going to end the game so they make a play and you go in a completely different direction and... and, and keep the game going another round or two rounds you mm -hmm. have to put pieces out every turn you're playing a card so you could end up just burying something you were hoping to uh you know finish with yeah and that is important to note you have to do it right so the the top part of the card where you take two coral and place it is not an option you can't choose not to take it every round you play a card you are putting new two new pieces of coral into your reef and based on the counts and the cards i don't think it's ever going to be possible to fill your reef like i don't think you'll ever hit that limit you might have a couple stacks that get to the four high but there's just not enough of the pieces in there and this is the main reason to remove some pieces when playing at different player counts because otherwise the game will go on longer than it can handle so overall as sean mentioned this is one of those simple to learn games that's easy to teach and play it's it's a really simple game mechanically this is the lightest of the next moon games, move games I've played. 
like this includes favorites we've mentioned on our podcast numerous times like the azul series this is is lighter than those this is 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 simpler quicker to teach but don't let that lightness fool you this is like that that perfect mix of easy to learn but difficult to master it's it's exactly what i want from an abstract game that is what i want from an abstract game when i pick one up one of the first places you're going to notice this is the timing right you always have to take and place coral on your card before you score it and that is so easy to forget you get so excited about the scoring thing on the bottom of the card and then you realize that by you got to place the coral first. And when you place it first, you're screwing over the scoring you planned on. Or maybe you don't screw up this card, but you screw up your next card because you would plan three steps ahead and totally meant to make this huge pattern. But now you had to screw it up by play the coral on top of it. Yeah, it's it's very easy to stomp on your own plans. Yeah. Um, and it's it's trying to keep it all in mind. Like you can keep, okay, I want to score this and this and this and this. That's easy to keep in your mind. But to keep, I want to score this and this and this, and I have to play this and this and this and this, mm -hmm. is that next level where your brain doesn't want to do that. Yes. Um, your brain wants to keep track of one of those things. You, you know, I'm going to place this and this and this and, and build these things, but to also keep track of all the different ones you want to score in their orders, mm -hmm. your, your brain's going to struggle with that and, and smoke. Smoke will emerge. Yeah. And like Sean, this, this, and this is a big part of it, right? A big part of Reef is strategy. You are planning ahead and you're not just planning ahead what I'm going to do on my turn when it becomes my turn. This is much more like chess. Like if you're playing chess well, you are planning multiple turns ahead, uh, possibly all the way to the end game, though I don't think you can quite go that far in a game of Reef. But like if you're not planning two, three, four turns, if you're not planning, I'm going to score this, then I'm going to put these two out and score this, and then I'm going to put these two out and score that, you're not playing effectively you're going to want to play a number of cards in a row and combine them together to make multiple complete scoring patterns. But then there's the fact it's not a solitaire game, right? You're playing with an opponent and you're going to try to predict what cards they need. And like Azul and the other games in the series, you also have the ability to hate draft, right? This is where you take a card that doesn't help you, but hurts your opponent. Remember your card limits unlimited. Like, sure, you may play it eventually, but you might just take that card and hold on to it. So if you remember what cards your opponent's taking, because you it's all public info, everything's face up, right? You might be able to see what they're planning to do. Like, oh, wait, I know two turns ago, he took a thing with two red. And now he's taking a thing that's for squares of red. And looking at his board, if he just gets two more red out there, he'll be able to make a third square. And that's a five point. Oh, that's 15 points. You know what? I am going to draft every card with the red coral on it until he somehow messes up his pattern. That is totally legit. And another great thing that I like about this that is better than chess is the fact that messing that up doesn't ruin the game. So Sean's got his pattern of four and four. And if he gets this card, he's going to put the last one down and score 15 points. Oh, Mo took all the red. Well, you know what? I've got this and this instead. So we're going to work this way. And that'll at least get me 12 points. Like there's always options. You never get dead ended. You're, you're never completely messed up by the other player taking something you wanted or needed. Yeah, no, it's, 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 the other, the other issue about this is trying to keep the patterns on your board already uh, and, and planning because it's all 2D, right? So everything you're doing is if you're looking straight down. Yes. But while you're playing the game, while you're sitting there, you're not looking straight down at it. You're <laughs> looking at a three-dimensional shape. And you're, look, you're seeing those colors underneath that mm -hmm. don't matter. The height matters, but the fact that there's a yellow underneath your red doesn't matter at all. The fact that the red is three high matters. And I think that's a very deliberate move in this game. I think they, they have very deliberately planned to make it more difficult by letting you look at it. Uh, because mm -hmm. if it was just, you know, if a piece turned gray when you put another piece on top of it, it would be a very different game because it would be easier to keep track of that pattern and not accidentally think about the color underneath something. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think that would ruin replaying digitally which I don't know if there's actually a digital version out there. If there is, someone let us know. Um, I, I don't know if there is, but I, if I designed it digitally, I'd want to just do the top down. Like right. just in my head, I would think I just want to display the top Where down. Where you really need the tabletop. And I think you simulator. do. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I really do think you do. Um, so the other thing with uh, the game becoming tactical, right? So you have that long-term strategy, but then all of a sudden someone does something you weren't expecting. So now you have to respond tactically. You have to look at what you have in hand and make a decision on how to move forward, right? Well, one of the problems with planning ahead 
is that market. And this leads me to mention player count because that chest like feel I mentioned is really only really present when playing with only two players because the market doesn't change once. Well, it might change by one card only once you throw in four players by the time it gets back to your turn, that market could be completely different. Literally three of the four cards could have been bought by other players. So having any form of multiple turn strategy becomes much harder. Now I would go so far as to say that the actual weight of the game changes based on the number of players where the weight and complexity of the game is higher with a lower player count because there's more you can plan ahead, whereas it's less with more players, which it could be a good or a bad thing. That That's you and your group and how much weight and complexity you like. Now, for me, if it's game night and I am sitting down to play some games, I think I'm going to want to play Reef 2 player. I want to want to sit down and have that mental duel against another player and try to predict what they're going to do and try to draft the cards they want while still scoring the most. But if I'm at a casual game night, perhaps one, say, at one of the local bars with some adult beverages involved, I'm going to want four people and just kind of half pay attention and put my reefs out and draft what's available and chat in between my turns and play completely tactically. Yeah, I, I think it scales really nicely in that way because of that fact that you don't have to concentrate as deeply in a larger mm -hmm. group. It allows you to just chat and have fun and, and not, you know, play four players ignoring each other and sitting quietly staring at a board. Yeah, exactly. And I actually think this is a feature of the game. Like the, the fact that it handles both. It, if you want to play a, a more strategic tactical game, you play it two players. If you just want to have some fun and put make some stacks and beautiful looking reefs, you play with four. Overall, I was extremely impressed with this game. Um, this is, again, we are not about the new hotness here. We're talking about a game from 2018, right? And soon as this was announced, I really wanted to check it out. This, this was announced as the unofficial follow-up to Azul. Again, same publisher, different, different designer, but there's definitely some similarities. And I am so glad I got this for my birthday this year. And I finally got to check it out. I really dig this game. Well, it's super light. Like, I, I don't know what the weight rating on Board Game Geek is. And I don't know if the people who rated it, how much they took into consideration that the ability to plan ahead. But like the mechanics, like I said, it's like four pages of rules. It's really simple with the, the, the basics of learning the game. But there's surprising depth here if you choose to take advantage of it, if you choose to plan ahead and watch what your opponents are doing and potentially hate draft. This is a game that's simple enough that my youngest daughter picked this up immediately. Like just, she just got it. But it's deep enough that Deanna, the heavy gamer in our family, is also happy to play it. So I'll admit she'd rather play something with a bit more meat to it like Azul, but she, I, she can be convinced to play. Now, what I'm really looking forward to is getting this game, getting Reef, out in public to public play events at our local game stores, our local cafes. I think this is going to be a great gateway game for new gamers as well as a good icebreaker game, right? The beginning of the night when people are just showing up and just sit down and play a couple of games of Azul or sorry, uh, Reef and get to know each other. And I also think it's going to be a good filler game to play while waiting for other tables to wrap up their games. Plus it has that bonus of the table presence. This is one of those games where people are going to come over, whoa, what's that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And so this is a weight of 1.83 right now wow, on Board low. Game Geek. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's sitting in a nice uh, rating of seven. And what's really interesting is, is a lot of the comments are, are people who are surprised by this game. They weren't expecting it to be as captivating as it was. Uh, and some interesting points out that, oh, I, th I thought I was uh, immune to AP until I played this game. <laughs> uh, there really is the potential that if you want to think at it, you can really get lost in thought and planning uh, so you'll beware if you are just sitting down to play this as a, as a time filler before the other big games start up again, uh, just be aware you may find yourself forgetting about the other game you were going to play as you try just one more game of Reef until the store is trying to close on you. Yeah, this one definitely has a let's play again feel. I definitely got that. Um, there's definitely, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I glanced at the chat, bad me. <laughs> Um, one of the things that, no, I'm off. I completely, we, we, we may have it, have an edit if you want to note the time, because I don't even know. No, I can see where I am in the notes. There was something I was going to mention based on what you said, but then you like, before you said the just beware part, but then you went on to that. So I didn't get to get in in between and now I can't remember what it was. 
AP. I think it was, know what it was. Uh, the the eight, how, how can someone on board game geek say I've never had AP before, but until playing this game, but it's rated less than two weight. Like those two to me don't go together. I think that's people not realizing how much depth's in this game. Yeah. I think that's what I what I was thinking about at the time. I was like, how can it be that low when people are having AP problems? Like the AP problems aren't weight one point eight three rated <laughs> games to me. Right. Anyway, moving on. If you like abstract strategy games at all, just pick up Reef. Pick it up at some point. It's uh, they're on a second printing. It's easy to find right now. Don't wait three years like I did. This is a very solid, thinky filler abstract. It's great for new gamers and experienced players. If you're looking for a game with great table presence to draw in a crowd, I think Reef is a good choice for this once we actually want to draw crowds to our tables again. If you found Azul to be a bit heavier than you wanted, but we're interested in something similar, Reef is a good choice there too. Now, if you are looking for a heavy game in any way, this is not that. Like we just said, less than a two weight on Board Game Geek. If you hate abstract games with pasted on themes, again, probably not for you. Though I do kind of want to suggest you give it a try. Because as we just noted in some of the Board Game Geek comments, many people, myself included, were surprised at the depth that is in this game. It might be worth giving a shot. All right, well, when you've got a chance, be sure to also check out our written review of Reef over at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. The Bellhops Tabletop right now is covered with a bunch of donations for the local uh, charity events because the kids cleaned up the front room. A bunch of awesome games that were donated by the awesome Terry Latorco. Uh, that Terry girl, people may know her from, who donated a ton of stuff for our Extra Life auction, including a full set of rising sun from uh, cool mini or not. So that is what's been going on on my table. Um, Deanna's used it to attend a couple classes. The problem is there hasn't been any gaming on there at all in the last week. So despite we actually had a date night the other day, um, we were both stressed out. We decided we needed a night off. That usually means playing some board games, like almost always. And I got to admit, I like, it doesn't happen to me often. I just didn't feel like it. It wasn't the, it was me. I was just like, I don't know. Like we should play some pile of obligations. I mentioned Aroma and she's like, Ooh, no. <laughs> I'm like, all right, fair. We won't play Aroma. And then I'm like, well, I don't know. Like normally we play Codenames Duet or some date night games or the mind, like, right. And I just, the only thing I suggested, she was like, yes, yes, let's play a space base. But I didn't even feel like setting it up because that game takes up a lot of room. It's, a, it's yeah. a much larger game than you would expect. Like the player boards, I don't know, too, two three feet long like it, it's significant yep so we didn't play any any actual board games so it didn't happen uh so i really got nothing to add gaming wise but i do want to talk about something um this is, it fits well for an ama episode because it's non-gaming content because instead of playing games what we did is we spent the night on tubi or tubby i'm assuming tubi because like a an old uh tv tube I want to say Tubby because it's kind of how we spell Bubby, which is what we call my mom. And Tubi is one of those uh, uh, video on demand channels, right? Like it's like a Netflix or a HBO or streaming, Hulu or streaming whatever. Video. Yeah, streaming video service um, that I had heard about on Twitter. Someone told me, you got to check out Tubi. It had recently launched on PlayStation. It's also available on the web or whatever. But I watch TV through my PlayStation. That's how we watch all TV. That's how I watch Netflix. That's how I watch Disney, whatever. So it recently launched on PlayStation. And people said, this is the best place for free anime. It is, is a fantastic source of anime, both classic and new. And I'm like, all right, cool enough. I went to try it. Didn't work. It wasn't on my PlayStation. I don't know if it was a Canadian thing or what. Well, it's back. And it just showed up about a week ago and I'm like, oh, Tubi's back. So we're going to check it out. And I checked it out ahead of time. And I, I was amazed by what's in here. Like, like this is, is, is such an impressive streaming thing. So what we did is we sat down and we watched some 1980s sci-fi fantasy called Classics. Uh, we started with some Star Crash. I cannot remember. Dan will probably remind me in the chat. We watched a John Corman's attempt to compete with Nightmare Before, or not Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, Never Ending Story. Never Ending Story had been a huge hit. So John Corman decided to make a family-friendly fantasy movie. And... I think 60% of that movie was actually scenes from Sorcerer and Deathstalker. 
that Roger Corman, Roger is that not Corman. what I said? Yeah, yeah, Roger Corman. Yeah, sorry, Roger Corman. And and they just used found footage. Well, not found footage, but you know, he used his own footage from previous movies he put out. And he used the soundtrack from Voyage Beyond the Stars. Like it it was it was bad. <laughs> like and a bad in a like I don't recommend you go watch it way. Not in a like Star Crash is bad, but it has lightsabers and stuff and this android character. And if you, you want to see what people did to, to rip off Star Wars, it's fantastic. And Sorcerer, I honestly think is one of the best fantasy movies ever made, possibly better than Conan. You just have to overlook the fact that it stars a couple Playboy playmates who get naked in the pool at the beginning. Because that's like the only scene. There's one scene at the beginning where a satyr shows up, the girls think their boys and there's a hilarious scene with the sats here but after that it's it's pretty normal from it, it's not as exploitive as some of the early early 70s stuff so overall like if you are looking to waste some time and you don't feel like gaming or can't game check out tubby like I, i'm going to use their quote which i agree with I, it's not gonna be a direct quote because i don't have it down but they have more movies than netflix and less commercials than cable and i totally agree with that the selection is amazing and the commercials really aren't bad so i've actually started uh you mentioned it to me and i, I threw it up on one of my uh other monitors on this this setup uh and i've been watching kitchen nightmares right now as, as i haven't mm -hmm. been in a movie mood as late of late and like to have something on that i can watch in the background while i'm working and don't need to you know focus on the way i might with a movie yeah, um, but if you want like old uh, anime for sure, like they, they have Robotech, all the three different series, both the English versions and the Japanese, which is something I've never gotten to see Robotech in Japanese. So I'm looking forward to checking that out. They've got classics like Har uh, Harlock. They even had Gigantor. I don't know who remembers that. It's 1960s mm -hmm. black and white it is considered the first ever Mecha series. It's what spawned yep. Astro Boy in from that Mecha. Now it's the English version of Gigantor that was released over here, but like there's Gigantor. There's, as I mentioned, the 80s classics, the, the, the Asian cinema section was like two, 310 different chop sake films right. and i am a big fan of foo and there was like all oh, like i swear every shaw brothers film ever published was there the old bruce lee's in the original chinese and not the redone north american dub versions like oh i i, I had said to d at the time i'm showing it to her and i'm like i have now have more food than i ever need that i could watch in my entire life that is something i that's a, to me is comfort food that's a lay down on the couch and put on some kung fu one of the odd things i noticed was they actually have two different versions whether you want to watch dubbed or undubbed rather than just choosing a, yeah, a it's language two selection separate. it's two separate movies and yeah. that was that was weird but you know that's just a little quirk so how about gaming i didn't have any you got uh, anything as far as gaming goes the only thing i have to say is i can't catch up and uh to purple and pass them when you're blocking the road so i can't pass you there was one move where i think you you'd done something and you were going into a curve uh yeah. and and i had I guess I'd been at a, I don't know, more advantageous starting point where I was. So I could have passed you and gotten a few blocks ahead, but you had the, uh, the higher score and I couldn't drop into the curve. Uh, so without... how is it you can't pass people? There's always three lanes. Uh, if you were in, if you're in the middle and have a five and I can't get to a five or better or like, like so if I can't beat your gear, I can't yeah. pass you on the side. Really? Yeah. See, I didn't even know that rule. Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. that was so you, that you was coincidental. You can't pass someone who's in a higher gear than you. You have to be the same or higher gear to pass. Oh wow. That there there's something I didn't even know in Rallyman GT. Well, I go. had no clue. <laughs> yeah, no passing. I didn't think you could ever block anyone. Yeah, oh no, blocking is a re uh, I the it hasn't happened it didn't happen this 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 game. Uh but there is some huge messes that occur in the beginning of that game mm -hmm. when people are off, shoot off of the off the gate depending on how the curves turn up and how people sort of you know time their speed into curves you can get these huge jam ups oh, right wow. at the beginning that, that that can hold that can really sway the whole game so it's only the middle lane well it depends it's, it's you uh you can't pass next to somebody if they're in a higher gear than you. Oh, just next, so middle would So if you're in the middle, most. you block both sides of you wow. If uh, that way. See, so. now I'm going to have to play a third game now that I know even <laughs> better what I'm doing. So the bad family film was Wizards of the Lost Kingdom. Okay. And again, like, in, unless you... It has the most ineffective hero ever in a movie. <laughs> like, he's just completely useless. And it's a child actor who was terrible. 
um the the hero in the movie was this barbarian that was played by some old washed up actor that wasn't buff like it just <laughs> didn't fit uh though there was a really awesome scene that i will mention the one thing that's almost worth watching it for is the kid's a sorcerer and he gets this idea and sneaks away and goes to a graveyard of old heroes and tries to use necromancy to resurrect them and it turns bad they didn't appreciate being resurrected i thought that was hilarious that that was really well done but then the resolution of that scene was completely stupid and the, the that they used found footage and they showed zombies getting cut up from another movie and then the fully fine zombies just went back into the ground like it it was bad but i like the concept of the child sorcerer trying to use his powers and it was just like i don't know i'll resurrect him. like there's no dark magic in the world it was just like a perfectly fine thing to do and just the heroes didn't like being brought out from their slumber so that part was cool other than that and, and just even while you say it is horrible um it it uh it got a sequel with david carradine <laughs> David Carradine's awesome for oh, yeah. four cheesy 80s movies. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, Death Ray 2000's on there. Go to Tubby just to watch Death Ray 2000, the original right. with David Carradine as Frankenstein. That's still one of my favorite cult movies of so, all time. So for for uh, for you know reference, Wizards of the Lost Kingdom is a 2.8 on IMDb. Wizards wow. of the Kingdom 2 is a 1.9. <laughs> wow. <laughs> all right. Oh, well, how yeah, about a that's... look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. Well, hopefully things die down a bit. Um, things get a little smoother here because I need to catch up on some things. Uh, I have some overdue items at this point. I hate that feeling. I hate having overdue things, but I also need to feed the kids and to make money. So some things have to get reprioritized. So one of the big things that's overdue is this box right here, which I am potentially going to open at the end of the show, just so I can at least get an idea on it. I have a box here that is for a current Kickstarter that I need to open up. So what this is, these are metal coins. Um, they're from the most well-known metal coin company, which is called Legendary Metal Coins they are launching their sixth kickstarter so this is not something new but it's their latest set which they think are the best set ever and they contacted me and said can you show these off well while, while our, our our kickstarter is live and well that launched today so i feel kind of bad because i would have liked to have gotten the content out for them so what i promised them is we will have the unboxing up on monday which means i need to record it so we are going to have to do that the kickstarter is live though if people want to check it out and that uh, one thing we'll do is toss a link up to their Kickstarter so that people can take a look for themselves. And that is kickstarter.com slash projects slash draw lab. And that's legendary dash metal dash coins dash season dash the number six. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Ryan Sheehan, sometime soon I'm going to have enough time to do the research required for your topic. It, it was on my list to do the short list to do this week until like, like you, this sale we're dealing with is, in, is not good. It is messed up and it's requiring way more work than usual. So I had to put it on hold. I don't know if we'll get to it next week because we do have another patron question I also want to get to. So we're getting to it. It's on the list. I apologize for not getting to it as quickly as possible. David Miller Jr. Thanks, David. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. You whole Rutila? Thank you. Uh, Jeff Seuss, who was in the chat room earlier, uh, we were this close to answering one of your questions tonight, but we decided Deanna would be better uh, to answer that question than the rest of us being the one most impacted by what happened. So we're saving that one for a future guest episode. Um, maybe we'll have a night Sean doesn't want to talk as much or something. We'll get Deanna on and we'll have Deanna show uh, answer that question so it's on the list you and brian's i'm not sure i might roll some dice to see which one comes first well that was the double bell uh, it means my shift's coming to an end and we're gonna have to lock those front doors though the doors to the lobby are closed you can always find us across the web and social media as tabletop bellhop one word visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com find the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast on your podcatcher of choice and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below when we remember. If you like the content we're providing, would like to support our continued efforts and help us to keep making this show and cover our costs, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists... 
Thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.